I'd like to introduce Mary Cloak. Uh, she's the CEO of the Liverpool Blue Coat. Uh, Mary's actually been a friend of ISR even before uh, my uh, tenure here at Edge Hill, which is now more than three years, which I can't believe. And was on the external advisory group of its predecessor, I4P, and has kindly stayed on and given us insight into the different things we can do as an institute. And that included last year her exceptional contribution to our How to Do Socially Distant Social Responsibility series, where the Blue Coat did some amazing innovations to keep your work going with those who had learning difficulties and dementia and all of those things. We really thank you for making that contribution. But we're not talking about that tonight, we're talking more about what makes a good arts venue. And I'm sure maybe over the last 18 months you've rethought a little bit about what makes a good arts venue. Um, so I'm sure you'll talk about that, but probably the whole, the whole thing in the round. So Mary's going to talk, and then my uh, Deputy Associate Director, Victoria Foster, is going to do the questions. And the whole thing should last about an hour. So over to you, Mary. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to say thank you very much. I just want to check on everyone here, because I'm... Um, famously very soft-spoken, so can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So I wanted to say I'm really excited to be here at a real in-life, in real life event. It is a great privilege to be uh, one of the first people back um, giving a real life uh, talk and I haven't actually seen a real life audience for a long time, so I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you very much to Joe for her kind remarks. I'm going to um, I'm considering this to be much more of a discussion because I think the idea of there's an authority on good arts venues is counter to the prevailing culture of a very collective and shared expertise approach. And I can already see that we have among us people who have very developed and interesting views on the subject. So I'm going to limit my, my remarks to um, you know, a relatively short piece uh, period of time and then I'm going to invite people to uh, contribute in a, not in a question and answer way but more in a co-contributor way so I hope that's okay with everybody. Great, so um, this talk series is in the Good Society programme. So I want to start by revisiting a publication that's been part of the debate and um, I think was very powerful in giving us pause for thought and that is What Makes a Good Society which is John Diamond and Katie Goldstraw's summation of the collective conversations about what makes a good society. And this report points out that there is no easy definition of what a good society is or how it might be achieved or who might undertake the task of creating one. They suggest rather that the solution might lie in dynamic collaboration between the public, private and voluntary sectors. And there's lots of different nomenclature for these, uh, civil society, uh, public policy, but it's basically this three-legged hydra, public, private and voluntary sectors. And they describe an emerging cohort of hybrid, responsible and ethical organisations that are skilled in collaborating across these three spheres. Organisations which acknowledge that society now extends beyond the nation state to a globalised and diverse world which can be navigated effectively only with tolerance and respect. And it's my contention that art centres like Blue Coat are key exemplars of such organisations and can play a pivotal role in creating a good society. As the report says, society is no longer just national, it's international and it's also local in the vitality and heterogeneity of its culture and the specificity of its challenges. Just this month, uh, um, an Imperial College London study published in The Lancet found marked regional variations in life expectancy and the most sobering I felt was a gap, that there's a gap of 27 years between a man living in the London borough of Kensing, Kensington in Chelsea compared to a man living in Blackpool in the North West. 27 years, that's almost a whole generation. So this is the context within which I'll consider the question, 
what makes a good arts venue. Basically, how can an arts venue play its part in creating a good society? So um, this talk will have four parts. First, I'm going to look at the policy context and see what policymakers and funders have to say that might help us define a good arts venue. And I'm choosing this uh, funder and policymaker route because since 2016, they, they, there has been widespread consultation and quite a bit of investment in research in this sector, and new policy thinking has emerged. Secondly, I'll draw on practical experiences of an arts organisation, which is Blue Coat, to see what this might lead us to add to the definition. Then, I'm going to look at key challenges that might prevent organisations from, bec from becoming good arts venues. And then finally, I'll summarise my recommendations for change if we're to overcome the challenges and create a cohort of good arts venues to support the collabor e collaborative effort to create a good society. It's my four-pronged uh, talk. So I'm going to define an arts venue as any space to which the public is invited to enjoy the arts. Some of the points I make will relate to arts organisations generally, and art centres more broadly, uh, but um, I will point out where arts venues have a very particular role to play. So what is it that makes an arts venue good? The potential social contribution of arts organisations has been acknowledged in recent changes in arts policy. The Arts Council's 2020 publication of Let's Create, which is a 10-year strategy for public art spending marked a real shift in emphasis towards the democratisation of the arts and this will undoubtedly have an impact on their social contribution. I wanted to point out the difference because the previous 10 year strategy had seen a commitment to great art for everyone and it subsequently broadened to great art and culture when the Arts Council took museums under their wing. But great art and culture for everyone and you see, it's this word for that became problematic with the policy developments uh, and the research and consultation that, uh, that happened since 2016. So it's this word that for is dropped. Uh, why, why would the small word for have such a big impact? It's because it suggests that there's a gap between those making art and those receiving art. I think the Arts Council had a, um, a, a conversion to, to understand that if, if you want to uh, achieve a vision of a creative and cultural country, that the best way to do it is with rather than for the people in it. And this new policy, Let's Create, recognises that the culturally rich and diverse environment in which we live has broadened definitions and changes in artistic practice, breaking down old divisions between public and art, audience and artist, great art and everyone. In this policy, the Arts Council takes a holistic view, recognising the creative potential in each of us as the bedrock on which to build its strategy and meriting public investment. And this is quite a breakthrough. It's the first time that public investment has been targeted towards everyday creativity. This, the, this approach in policy calls from a, for an inclusive response from organisations and venues and foretells a much more participative and engaged offering by arts organisations. The strategy's ambition is that in the England of 2030, Everyone will be able to develop and express creativity throughout their life and that villages, towns and cities will thrive through a collaborative approach to culture. To achieve these outcomes, the strategy acknowledges the necessity of a professional cultural sector that generates new ideas, works easily and effectively with others and is adept at collaboration. It also needs to develop diverse talent from every community. And here we see an echo of what Diamond and Goldstraw spotted at the very beginning in their collaborative conversations uh, of, social, of social good, 
that the, there is a, a need for collaborative working uh, by, by hybrid, by hybrid organisations. So I'm going to propose that these three characteristics generate new ideas, works easily and effectively with others, and develops diverse talent, get added to our list of what we might call a good venue, good arts venue. Local policy now is more explicit and immediate in the, so in the social value that it requires for arts venues. Liverpool City Council cultural strategy says that the imperative to build back better is at the heart of the cultural strategy to ensure that culture contributes more and more sustainably to the health, well-being and opportunity of all people and all communities across Liverpool. I've chosen as an example these two policymakers, Arts Council and Liverpool City Council, because they're crucially important for Blue Coat. But these are trends that have been emerging as common across many of the major arts funders and local authorities and think tanks even, including Liverpool City Region, uh, and the World Economic Forum, there are, there are many. Uh, but I would argue that if you wanted to take the recommendations of Liverpool City Region and World Economic Forum, Forum then you would have to add, in terms of the expectations of what makes a good arts venue, a contribution to health, opportunity, well-being, economic development, and a champion of social change. So the list is getting longer, and... I am um, considering this list to be parallel to public expectations. These are public expectations of arts venues. But it is the Gulbenkian Foundation, which is the funder that led the way with this democ democratic thinking. It, in 2016, it launched an inquiry into the civic role of arts organisations. They used metaphors to help understanding that this, the civic role that good arts organisations play nationally and in their communities. These really resonated with us at Blue Coat. They described arts organisations as colleges, so places of lifelong learning, enabling everyone to reach their potential. And at Blue Coat, we think about that all the time, about ways in for people uh, to the arts. As town halls, which are safe places for considering and debating difficult issues, they can present complex issues in full, these debates, enabling people to hear and think about both sides of an argument. Such debates are a regular feature at Blue Coats programme. And before lockdown, we hosted a seminar on racial exclusion. And recently, we have convened an online debate about the experience of social class difference. And I know that people here have attended, have attended many of those debates. Home. Uh, as places of safety and belonging, where people can relax and be themselves, places that can be a space to make work based on people's own experiences and aspirations. And at Blue Coat, we attach the idea of being welcoming to this metaphor. We want people to feel at home at Blue Coat. And parks. Arts organisations offer shared public space that is open to all. At Blue Coat, our physical location in Liverpool city centre surrounded by highly commercial regeneration, means that we, by making our public spaces accessible, offer a counterweight to the huge swathes of the city centre where it's no longer possible to just be yourself because they're owned or controlled by commercial interests. We want people to think that there are other ways which you can consider spending your time than consuming and spending money. So public... Over, over, the, over all these um, consultations that the Trust Foundations, the funders, the local authorities carried out, it's clear that public expectations, which are always evolving, and policymakers following public opinion, as they inevitably do, have been looking to arts organisations to play their part. And on the positive side, there is huge potential for this policy shift to pay dividends, by focusing resources on organisations that have a social impact. Arts venues specifically are an important subset of this because uh, venues have tangible resources and particularly space that can contribute to the civic culture. So I would suggest that the ability to play one or all of these roles might be added to our growing list of what makes a good arts venue on our uh, slide. So the second um, 
group of uh, inputs and experiences that I'm going to use to build up this picture is practical experience. Now, it is the case that arts organisations have gradually become more embedded in the communities they serve than ever before and have started to provide a range of services and functions for local people that might not normally resonate immediately with the idea of an arts centre. This trend has been accelerated by the pandemic with some arts organisations switching over to emergency relief. One dramatic example is Slung Low Theatre Company, who are based in Holbeck in Leeds. Slung Low was set up in 2000, and it's a theatre company specialising in making epic productions in non-theatre spaces, often which, with large community performances at their core. So a few years ago, this is before the pandemic, Slung Low based itself in Hol Holbeck, which is a, an area in Leeds which has some challenges, and they took over the management of a working men's club that was no longer financially viable. And by taking over the management of it, they kept the members, kept it working as a working man's club, and they secured its financial future because they were able to manage it with grants and so on, and it revitalised the community role of that club. So in response to lockdown, Slung Low set up a food bank alongside the outdoor theatre activities. So it's this um, idea that you've got resources, you've got a space, you're in an arts venue, how do you use it in, in service of the community? This activism is mirrored in many organisations closer to home. For example, the Old Court Arts Centre in Wigan, who delivered food parcels and arranged home visits during the pandemic. Also, I've noticed the work being undertaken by many organisations that are part of the Creative People and Places programme. For example, Heart of Glass in St Helens, who, as a form of public education, and community support commissioned artists to create new works highlighting the importance of care and self-care in the pandemic. These are all examples of close community connections which form important elements of a good arts organisation and provide visible examples of social contribution. So I think based on the work of these organisations we might therefore add the characteristic responsive to local need to our growing list uh, of what makes a good arts venue. So I'm now going to talk about our approach at Blue Coat. And based on our experience there, explore the distinctive contribution that the arts might make to a good society in an arts venue like Blue Coat. So some facts about Blue Coat first. As a former school, Blue Coat has some 40 rooms which house classes and studios for over 30 artists and creative enterprises, as well as Blue Coat's own activities, which are growing. Public spaces include four galleries, a performance space and an open access garden. We have 50 staff, a number of which vary seasonally, and turnover is approximately 2 million, of which 750,000 comes from public sources. 750,000 from trading and rent, and the remaining funds are raised from foundations and donations. So this is the kind of social enterprise, partly publicly funded, partly voluntary organisation that could be considered a hybrid in the Good Society lexicon. We're based in Liverpool City Centre, in the middle of Bang in the Middle, and this shapes our approach to managing our activities. So. I want to look at Blue Coat's experience in three, under three headings. The first is Blue Coat in the city. So Liverpool, and, and many people here will know this well, is a vibrant and multicultural city with significant Chinese, African and Indian communities. The last reliable data published was that in the 2011 census, and this stated that communities outside of the white British or Irish category made up 13.8% of Liverpool's population. We are expecting this figure to go up when the 2021 census data is published next year. And in addition to this cultural vi culturally vital place, Liverpool is one of the most deprived local authorities in England, ac according to a definition of deprivation, obviously. A 2019 report on the index of multiple deprivation 
Liverpool is third of the most deprived 317 local authority areas. And this is before we've seen the impact with COVID. So with this context, we have to consider at Blue Coat how we make ourselves relevant to a, a wide variety of people with different perspectives and backgrounds. We believe, as everyone in the arts does, that the arts have a lot to offer and that they are themselves a good, a good thing. But we can't assume that the opportunities the arts offer will be recognised and accepted by everyone. We have to consider carefully how we're reflecting life being current and relevant to the people who make up our community and how we can create imaginative ways into the arts for everyone. And although Liverpool often appears at the top of many deprivation indexes, it remains a highly popular tourist destination. So it's a city of contrasts. As we work with the City Council and many networks across the city to present a place-based, coherent cultural programme for national and international audiences, Culture becomes central to Liverpool as a, as, a, as a destination. And Blue Coat is in turn central to this, not just for the programme of exhibitions and events and activities and our projects, but also for our significant city centre building. So as we planned during lockdown for how best to support the city to reopen, we wanted to make the place really welcoming as people started to re-emerge. We wanted Blue Coat to be an attractive social space, inviting and warm and hospitable, where everyone from the casual passerby to the fully committed artist would have an opportunity to engage with the arts in some way, however fleeting. So we had a, we went through a process of thinking root and branch about what we represented, what were the key things that we wanted people to know and believe about Blue Coat. And we came up with these four uh, pillars that were known for breaking new ground, inspiring curiosity, unlocking the creative process. In other words, we're a work site for artists and we offer people opportunities to maybe find out a little bit about making work as well as enjoying the presentation of it. And we've had a long-standing commitment to being purposely inclusive. So this was our um, rebrand or our makeover during lockdown because we just wanted the city to be proud and for people coming out after COVID lockdown not to be only queuing up, queuing up for Primark where it's just right next to us, huge queues for Primark. We wanted people to have something really nice, inclusive and welcoming as well. So we started a programme of looking at outdoor spaces to exhibit artwork and here we have uh, an example of three exhibitions where we uh, asked the artist if, if they would be happy to share their work outside the safe space of the gallery and uh, this is the Samaya Kaider, this, this is the current show that's on at the moment and that's Fox Fisher, which is part of Homotopia. And it was very popular. Uh, we also wanted to redo our cafe. If people been, haven't been in the cafe, this is a bit of a spoiler. But it, we wanted it to be just a lovely place to come. And yes, you can have a cup of tea or coffee if you want. But we wanted to um, give a sense that the people of Liverpool deserve to have a nice place to go, which is their own. And we also wanted to make the opportunity to experience art not dependent on actually going into a formal gallery, but if you popped in, you could have a, 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 an experience of one of these commissions, even if your visit was very fleeting. And I wanted to take that, the whole of that, experience that Blue Coat had of just being there for the people of Liverpool after lockdown and add it to our list, not as one of the civic roles of being a park or a town hall or having to do something, but just being there. Just in, in economic theory, it's called option value, where, uh, do we have any economists in the 
in the audience. So, okay, often value is where you want, you never go and visit a place like a museum, but you really want it always to be there so that if you have visitors, they could go there, or your children might want to go there someday, or you even might go there someday yourself, but yeah, not now. So that's called option value. And we wanted Blue Coat to be a place to be really proud, and I would like to add that to the, to the list as being there. Also commissioned, uh, because we felt that the city needed a little bit of gaiety, we commissioned a platform from Simon and Tom Bloor. It was based on designs take, um, uh, developed in workshops with our schools programme, Out of the Blue, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and we felt that it, the whole town needed a little bit of colour, and I think this definitely achieves that. So, I'm calling that being there in the city, and that's just, we want to be uh, an amenity for people uh, who can come and use us whenever they want to, but they're going to know we're always there. So that's, I'm proposing to add that to the definition, being there. The second blue coat uh, example I want to use is our targeted programme. So I'm using three examples from, from blue coat, uh, being there targeted programmes and uh, artists, fostering diverse artists. So we have a number of targeted programmes and I spoke about some of these when we were um, talking about keeping going at, outside of COVID, uh, outside of the venue during COVID. I'm going to talk about three now, Baby Book Club, Out of the Blue and Young Blue Room, because our work with children is particularly important. We aim to support young children and young people from all backgrounds to access high quality enriching arts and cultural experience from the early possible, earliest possible age and we aim to give parents, carers and teachers the confidence to support the creative development of children and young people they care for and work with. We serve significant numbers of children and young people including those who face particular barriers to accessing cultural activities with a range of opportunities that contribute to their creative development, cultural capital and social mobility. So even though we can't address issues of poverty, exclusion, deprivation directly, what we can do is make sure that there is a cohort of people who have um, that cultural capital that will help them to address and mitigate some of their circumstances later in life. Many of our programmes are evaluated using an accessible framework based on the five creative habits of mind created by Bill Lucas and Guy Claxton, which outlines the key changes in behaviour that creativity sparks in our participants. And there's five. Work together. This is, these are skills that are monitored when children are um, playing in the after-school clubs. Work together, which is cooperate effectively, encourage each other, pass on skills and proudly share the outcome. Investigate, ask questions, wonder and explore, challenge the assumptions. Three, never give up, persist in difficult moments, tolerate uncertainty. Four, use your imagination, play with possibilities, make connections and grow as an artist. Develop techniques, reflect critically and improve your craft. So they're the five creative habits of mind. And all our children and family programmes are designed and and evaluated according to how they help uh, children to change and develop in these five areas. These changes in behaviour in turn underpin outcomes associated with improved health and well-being, increased confidence and self-esteem, a sense of connection and belonging and the development of cognitive and physical functions. We are increasingly turning to this framework to help us develop activities as well as assess their impact. So, of the children's programmes, the first I want to talk about is Baby Book Club. So, you can see here that um, literacy level, literacy vulnerability in Liverpool and the North West, the highest areas are the red ones, but these are among the highest in the country. Uh, Baby Book Club is an informal learning programme that runs for 10 weekly 90 minute sessions. It's been designed with and for parents with babies aged 3 to 12. 
months and it has been delivered three times a year at Blue Cook since 2013 until we had to suspend it early in 2020. Our first club, 2021 in October, sold out in record time because we're back. And through group sessions with a professional storyteller and educator, Roger Hill, a facilitator from our staff team and a trained volunteer, parents learn the skills to make reading with their baby a fun and fruitful experience. They're introduced to a range of high quality books and techniques for using them to achieve a range of outcomes. They enjoy a supported visit to the local library and design and make a storybook for their own baby. Most importantly, the confidence they develop helps them to enjoy reading together, putting in place early habits that will pay dividends as their children grow and start to read themselves. The clubs are delivered in a supportive and safe atmosphere with time before and after the formal session for interaction. Our skilled participation team staff and volunteers have experience of working with vulnerable people and seeking ways to enable them to engage effectively and find new confidence and these skills are transferred to Baby Book Club. Having or caring for a baby can be an isolating experience. We know through our ongoing work with children and their families in communities facing deprivation that parents can feel isolated by economic circumstances, lack of support and other familial and social issues. And particularly where we are in city centre, we're finding that sometimes there are very small nuclear families where the family network, uh, the family network that the parent might have is, is removed. Week by week, the facilitators build up people's confidence to share with the group and the clubs help parents and carers to form new social networks. Reading with babies is a key contributor to improved later life opportunities. The Baby Book Club contributes to giving children as young as four months the foundation for a great start in life. It could be seen as one of the cornerstones of the levelling up agenda. Um, did I just do that? Yes. So, um, I just wanted just to point out that this baby has a book, but Roger Hill, who is our facilitator, is an absolutely amazing guy, and he has these techniques that if you don't have a book, if you're with your child in a cafe or something and just don't have a book around, but the opportunity to tell a story might, might come up, you might be inspired to tell a story. So he has a fabulous technique of taking a teaspoon in the cafe and making it into a little person and uh, making up a story about this little teaspoon person and if you've heard Roger talk, talk like this, you never look at a teaspoon again in the same way the rest of your life, it's just very very imaginative, it, it is life changing both for the babies and the and the uh, and the parents, and we, we have we have a blue coat, a ge uh, you know a generational approach to audience development. We want these babies to be bringing their grandchildren to visit blue coat uh, in 60 years time. So we have long term ambitions. So the next program is out of the blue. So out of the blue is responding in part to the Durham Commission on Creativity and Education where evidence shows that teaching for creativity confers personal, economic and social advantage. As a matter of social justice and national interest, it should be available to all young people, not only to those who can afford it. That was the Durham Commission. Out of the Blue aims to address this inequality of opportunity in Liverpool, where many children live in poverty, by creating regular, creative and cultural opportunities for children from restricted economic backgrounds, enabling them to develop and identify a cultural capital of their own from a very early age. Out of the Blue currently operates in four Liverpool neighbourhoods, Anfield, Clubmore, Norris Green and Picton, and will soon relaunch in Runcorn, all including households in the 1% most deprived in the country. Each club is unique, reflecting the diversity of the specific community, including children from countries in conflict, uh, black and minority ethnic backgrounds, restricted economic situations and with special educational needs. Importantly, Out of the Blue nurtures children's creative habits, encouraging the development of imagination, curiosity, persistence, 
collaborative working and discipline. These transferable skills we maintain will enhance their future prospects and enable greater social mobility. Out of the blue activities impact on the creative and personal development of a significant proportion of members. And this, these are the uh, stats from one of our clubs. We've got 73% improved in wondering, 87 improved in sharing, and 86% improved in cooperating appropriately. So we can actually prove that these creative and artistic activities are making a formative difference in, in the lives of these children. So there's four different strands of activity in Out of the Blue. And the team goes into schools, they have weekly after school sessions, one every day, it's a Monday school, a Tuesday school, uh, where there's an after school club. And then the children are invited to Blue Coat during the school holidays for a week long program. So it means they have to come into town, we help them to get the bus, uh, if, if needed, come into town every day, visit Blue Coat, get used to it as a venue, um, become familiar uh, with the artistic activities that happen in galleries and in, in uh, off-site workshops. Then at the end of the week, a family, the, we have a family day and the whole family is invited to come and see what the children have done and to enjoy some tea and do some activities together as a family at Blue Coat. We've also started more recently co-commissioning and co-curating with the children. So the platform that you saw earlier uh, was, um, there was a program for the whole summer of performances and activities on the platform. And all of those activities were chosen by the children from Holy Family School. Holy, Holy Family School, yes. Um, they were very ruthless um, judges of the proposals were all sent in and they were on video. And the children sat as a, a jury, a, you know, curator's jury, and they, and they picked the, the acts they liked. So they're also learning about that question of choices. Um, and it is working because the data we have shows that 106 children attended our clubs, and 56 of them, 56 percent of them, came on into the holiday activities, uh, both at Blue Coat and elsewhere. 46% attended family activities, so that means they brought their whole, their whole family, and that's been going up for a while. And we've got this approach of recalling the stepping stones. Like if you start an after-school club, you come to the half-term, you bring your family, and then you start you know, curating and co-commissioning on platform. That's a progression route for children, which we feel is uh, just valuable um, in, in, in the context that we've described for Liverpool. And it's also had a, this Out of the Blue project has also had a significant impact on the diversity of audiences for our public programmes. So 18% of attendees of public family arts activities in 1920 were black, Asian or of multiple heritage. And 8% included a disabled child in their group. And 31% lived in first decile households on the index of multiple deprivation. And these are all figures which showed increases of at least 10% year on year. So it is working. I'm going to come back to the question of how you roll these out and the resource issue uh, later. Young Blue Room then, finally. Oh, uh, yes, that's our platform thing. Uh, Blue Room. Blue Room, I think uh, many people might be familiar with Blue Room from our um, seminar in the socially distant social responsibility. But just to um, gives a little background. We've made a long-standing commitment at Blue Coat to support adults with learning disabilities to be active and visible parts of the arts community. In 2008, Blue Room was launched after 10 years of project work. And it, it, we, what we did was we had weekly sessions with a steering group of five people with learning disabilities supported by partners at Liverpool City Council and through this learned how to make it work really well for Blue Room. So through this, Blue Coat was a pioneer in the transformation of day services and the project continues to run for three full days each week at Blue Coat. We've got a, a Tuesday group, a Wednesday group and a Thursday group. We have 12 members each day with moderate and severe learning disabilities. Regular visits to cultural spaces provide a starting point for discussions and activities covering ground often left untrodden by people with learning disabilities. 
We successfully sustained our Blue Room projects digitally during the pandemic with support from Arts Council England and we recently re returned to in-person delivery. They're back on site, the Blue Room members. As well as contributing to health and well-being, Blue Room provides accessible professional development for people with an interest in pursuing a creative career. We have a permanent studio space at Blue Coat to allow members to develop their individual practice as artists. Two of our Blue Room members, Veronica and Josh, were invited to exhibit at galleries abroad and Veronica, despite lockdown, exhibited in Australia. This is a significant progression for them from the time they started with us. We also have volunteering opportunities on our children and families program which enable members to gain valuable work experience as assistant facilitators. So rather than being a service user as a learning disabled person, if you volunteer on the Children and Families program, you become a service provider. So we and just as a next step in this, we hope very soon to be able to employ our first learning disabled staff member as part of the delivery team. So we're now moving into Young Blue Room and we are starting an, we started an off an off-site project with our partners at Norton Priory in Runcorn for young people with learning disabilities aged 18 to 30. And we've also got ambitions to start a young people's program in Liverpool for the same age, where we're going to work with a very small group of engaged young people to design it. So these are young people with exceptional challenges, but we feel that by welcoming in them into the Blue Room family, we will be able to, again, um, ha give an opportunity to develop social, social and cultural capital and help people to mitigate challenges that they may have in the future. Alongside that we have some other projects which I'll just run through quickly. Where the arts belong, we work with um, people on a dementia journey in partnership with Belong in the Belong, vi belong Villages. And we have a we have a, a fa we have a family pro prom program of family activities and we have um, Projects which are very small and bespoke, but which, when you take them all together, could be called targeted programmes with social impact. And I'm going to suggest that because these programmes are so successful and can be tangibly proved to be so, that we add to our list, our growing list of definition of a good arts venue, targeted programmes with social impact to that list. Finally, there will be three things for Blue Coast, uh, being there in the city, targeted programmes of social impact and fostering diverse artists. So at Blue Coast, this is, the, this is the third one, diverse artists. At Blue Coast, we're an artist work site alongside a presenting venue. We've got you know, artists working way in the studios. So we see the whole cycle of the development of artistic work from start to finish, from the earliest glimmering of an idea to the public presentation. What's clear from our experience in this area is that deliberate interventions are needed if we want to ensure that the voices and life experiences represented in the work we show to the public present and reflect the communities we serve. One of the key findings in our work at Blue Coat is that it takes a long time to effect change in this regard. We've had a long-term commitment to showing and supporting artists from diverse backgrounds. At the moment, we're delighted to host in our galleries three exhibitions by black women artists all on together with a separate exhibition. Deborah Roberts, an established international artist from Texas. Rosa Joanne Udo, an artist from London who has emerged onto national platforms in the last two years. And Samaya Kaider, a local artist from Toxteth in Liverpool for whom this is her first show. So these exhibitions are part of our established practice, a manifestation of a long-term policy of showing artists from diverse ethnic backgrounds. At Blue Coat, we try to support artists right throughout their working life with specific help at key stages. Uh, this exhibition here has three artists at different stages and will help to establish a progression route for each. So, um, because the artists hadn't met before, and uh, now as a result of the exhibition, Deborah, who's a very 
significance of international figure is buying art by Samaya, piece, some pieces by Samaya, introducing her to her contacts and generally being very supportive. So we're, we're really, really happy with how, how that's been working. But it is the result of a long, long-term policy. So Blue Coat first created an exhibition exclusively for black artists called Black Skin Blue Coat in 1985. It was curated by our then artistic director, Brian Biggs, who was a visionary in relation to the inclusion of outside voices. Four emerging artists, Keith Piper, Eddie Chambers, Sonia Boyce and Tom Joseph were invited to, um, after a lot of debate, Brian says, a lot of uh, coming and going, he uh, organised for four separate exhibitions for these four artists and it was not popular or profitable at the time to exhibit work by black artists in Britain. But um, this, and this, this, he set up that commitment in 1985 and since then we have stood by that commitment to creating opportunities for artists who have experienced challenges in having work seen on the national stage. So we've continued this consistently with Keith Piper and Sonia Boyce who are in this show here, both came back to show at Blue Coat. Uh, that's Sonia's piece there. Um, now Keith is a professor in Middlesex and Sonia is a professor in the University of the Arts London respectively, but they've come back and shown later on. Subsequent exhibitions then we've had in this uh, vein are John O'Connor's The Unfinished Conversation, which was a film about the life of Stuart Hall, Jade Montserrat's Institute in Care, uh, which is that one there, and Grace and Dirichu's The Ark, which we've also seen. By ensuring that the lived perspectives of a wide range of individuals are presented in the images we see and the narratives we learn of and, and contribute to a plural and inclusive ethos, we think that this is a, a socially important contribution. Black artists remain underrepresented in exhibition programmes as art students and as teachers of art in schools and at universities. Ronnie Mead Trust's 2020 report into race and racism in secondary schools demonstrated the discouraging effect on black, Asian and ethnically diverse students because of 94% of art teachers being white. So this thing of having no um, cultural resonance in the experience of art at school, that's, that follows on into people not entering the arts, arts workforce. So at Blue Coat, encouraging artists who may not approach a career in the arts through a traditional route is one of the steps needed, and in general fostering diverse artistic voices is a characteristic based on the experience of Blue Coat that is an essential part of the good arts venue. So this is, and, and this, this culture of fostering uh, capability in diverse communities and people from lived experience, different lived experiences, is not limited to artists. It also applies to freelancers, creatives, and just looking after people. Especially this was really clear during the lockdown when a lot of freelancers were cut loose. So as you can see, there's a growing list of what makes a good arts venue, growing list of expectations. Um, uh, so what are we going to do with this definition? I want to point out some challenges. I'm not going to dwell on financial sustainability uh, or indeed environmental impact but there are uh, very significant challenges in both of those especially for Blue Coat we're a mixed economy art centre in the middle of Liverpool uh, very expensive building to run um, but also a building that has a lot of energy needs because it's built in 1717 so there challenge the the impact the challenge that I want to focus on here uh, today is the one where action, I feel, is urgently called for, and that's the persistence of a profile of the arts workforce, its participants, artists and audience, that is not representative of our society. And as long as these equalities remain, the arts and arts venues will not be able to contribute effectively to a good society. There's been a lot of it. This is a really good book by David Bryan et al. It's called Culture is Bad View. And in it, he explores, him, him and his team explore how chronic issues of class, race, and gender underrepresentation persist, even though um, there are a lot of initiatives 
uh, and even though he is he's very good at exploding some myths, so uh, he did he did some studies about cohorts of arts workers uh, to find out if the generation of angry young men and working class actors coming through, especially people in Liverpool like Judy Walters, Willie Russell, all that generation of people, if that was a moment when actually the class profile of the arts changed and people started to get on, but it actually turns out that it wasn't. And even though that was a moment when there was marginally more working class people working in the arts as artists and behind the scenes, uh, since then, it's radically declined even further, so it wasn't a moment where things improved. So, I have to say why. This is, this is not just a question of social justice or equity. It's absolutely essential to address this lack of representation because the arts, media, museums and publishing are crucial in creating representations of individuals, community and societies. It's what we see every day in advertising, television, as well as in the arts. Uh, so who works in these occupations? For example, their class origins, their gender, their ethnicity is important for ensuring good, well-rounded representations on page, stage and on screen, as well as in galleries and museums. In the sphere of social class, the study shows that individuals from upper middle class origins are currently overrepresented in many creative occupations compared to those from working class origins and compared to society as a whole. And another interesting uh, concept that the team with Dave O'Brien has uncovered is what's called the somatic norm. And a, a, a syndrome has started where people will be from what can be defined as middle class background, but adopt the outward veneer of being working class. And apparently that's, that's a syndrome that that has become more and more common. I, um, I'm going to need to look into that a bit more, but this, this, this book is a very well worth while read. It's a substantial piece of work. So there are initiatives such as the Gerwood Bursary, which have focused on the social mobility of individuals, which supports paid placements and bursaries. So that's where a, an individual from a uh, background, social background not normally represented in the arts gets an opportunity to come for a year and get paid in full um, but the continuity for the individual is a problem so uh, if, if an individual is to sustain a career a year is great but it's not a, a, a long term solution uh, race remains a, an issue and a problem this um, figure I think is really shocking on the workforce front. 2.7% of the arts workforce are from black Asian and ethnic, ethnic minority uh, backgrounds. So um, even if we get people in into the arts workforce or in to, in to be artists or creatives or freelancers through initiatives and schemes, getting in is one thing but getting on is also uh, an area where major barriers exist. Several schemes and programmes address transitions from education into cultural jobs, but very few focus on mid-career development, and it's this problem of keeping going in a career in the arts that's a challenge. Lots of opportunities maybe to have a little dip in and out, but the uh, arts workforce is full of people who have been able to afford to subsidise themselves for many years in a career until um, a fully paid job came through. So more effective than these isolated uh, placements would be an organisational change programme, so that doesn't focus on the mobility of individuals, but focuses on, um, focuses on the organisation as a whole. And to be a good arts venue, I think this idea of having equality in, in the workforce, or representation in the workforce, and on volunteers and audiences, artists is is very important. So we just our own experience on that is that's Nina Newbold. Nina ha, was our is now our Gerard Bursary. So Nina came through. Uh, we did an advertisement for somebody from a so uh, a, a social background not normally represented in the arts. There's a very clear um, methodology for deciding that's to do with uh, parental occupation. 
uh, access to free school meals if you're in that age cohort and there's a number of other characteristics that you, you choose. Uh, so we, we limited our advert in Blue Coat to North West, uh, from Liverpool, connection to Liverpool and based in the North West and we had 248 applicants of good, applicants of good quality for that one bursary. So that, that would just give you a sense of how hard it is just to get in and then getting on, I mean, we're going to see if we can support me in different ways, but it's just, it's just really difficult. And this is why the workforce remains uh, so unrepresentative. I want to give an example of Ben and Sam. So Ben has been working, Ben came into Blue Coat after catering college, and he's been working at Blue Coat now for 10 years. And he's actually now got a job in the arts because he came in through the catering route. And it's another type of uh, approach that if we had a, a, f a whole organisation uh, initiative that we would look at different and more imaginative ways of bringing people in. I want to put up here uh, for public scrutiny, these are our uh, diversity figures. Um, so every year we are now monitoring uh, what our staff cohort is, our board, our audience, our artists and our participants of public programmes are on as much as we can find out on the basis of socioeconomic status, on the basis of ethnicity, and on the basis of disability, because we really want to do our small, play a small part in making this change. So that brings us to change. So how to create change? Um, if I'm to to summarise and say how we would overcome the challenges, it's obviously clear that change is needed. Uh, I would say we need funders uh, to, to enable long-term approaches to things and not require immediate results. We, de we need an arts workforce that reflects its communities and develops artists uh, that are rep and uh, participants that are representative. We need a common language and classification system for the distinctive contribution of the arts which supports arts organisations to articulate and communicate the value and importance of the work they do. And a lot of the things I've said this evening have represented the value of the arts in social terms, but there are other ways of, of assessing whether an artistic venue is valuable or not. It's just we have very little language and equipment to do that. And finally, I think there's a need for additional training and support for the producers, curators, and artists to develop the skills needed to work with communities and individuals along the spectrum of engagement. So returning to policy makers, uh, policy makers have come up with these change programmes. Um, there's, uh, if, if you want to apply for money from the Arts Council now for the next four years, you've got to do uh, quite a lot of internal organisation change under these four investment principle headings. Um, which are very good uh, ways of helping organisations to change, but also very demanding from a resource point of view. But this is part of the policy change that the Arts Council has um, come up with. The, going back to the Gulbenkian, who probably done the most thinking about this, here we see that the change needed is to equip people to be able to collaborate more, communicate better, connecting internationally, and to create the conditions for change. This is another change programme that is envisaged to help us address those challenges. But I would have to say that despite fully committed organisations, the sector is experiencing a period of exhaustion and is overstretched with change following the COVID-19 pandemic. Things came back to normal quite quickly after the um, uh, restrictions were lifted and I, I'm not sure that, certainly not in the arts sector and arts organisations, that people have had time to adjust or to um, work through any trauma that was caused by the pandemic. So it's not a, an ideal time for change. But the potential contribution from a high functioning cohort of good arts venues is enormous. Uh, and if we can make the change, I think it will be world changing. But we also have to remember that there's a very high weight of expectations. If you see that list of uh, what is a good arts venue, it's long, it's getting longer, and it could, I'm hoping, be added to by uh, the audience this evening. So, to conclude, at Blue Coat, our social commitment is fundamental. I want to go back to this, I think it's a really pivotal piece of work. Uh, we, we want to be one of those hybrid organisations. We have ambitions to grow 
as an organisation and to double our pre-COVID visits at Blue Coat from 700,000 before COVID to 1.4 million by 2030. To achieve this, we'll have to develop the way we work, communicate and connect with audiences at the heart of which is the local community and its needs. We cannot satisfy them all. There are great, there is a great weight of expectations, but we can reach out to many through the arts. Over the next year, we're working on an in-depth change programme and we, will, we, we, we absolutely can see the potential and we're very actively looking for the extra investment that it will take for us to become a good arts venue. Previously, the ethical value of arts work in a social setting has often been implicit, tacitly understood, but perhaps the challenges of recent years should inspire us to be more confident in declaring the moral worth of the arts centre as a site of social inclusion and justice and the focus of development of a healthy civic culture as well as a place of gaiety, reflection and enjoyment for all. Thank you. Can you see that now? Thank <laughs> you.